All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chanda Bimkisem, and I'm a stream owner here at Aggregate Intellect. Um, AI Science is a group of machine learning practi practitioners sharing research knowledge uh, relevant to different applications of machine learning. Um, I myself uh, am a researcher and VP of machine learning at Undoc, a startup aimed to help with smart scheduling. Um, I'm interviewing Omar Guerrero here, who is a research fellow at the Alan Turing Institute um, and postdoc at UCL, who will be explaining policy priority inference, which is essentially the using of simulations, uh, multi-agent simulations, to further help government decision and government strategy. Um, Omar Guerrero has also received further funding from the United Nations to, to further uh, insights into this, um, and I very much look forward to this discussion on using simulations and synthetic data to help make better decisions for sustainable government. Uh, so Omar, go ahead uh, and you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Shenda, and thanks any, everyone who is joining and thanks for the invitation. And, um, well, so uh, I will talk you through this uh, research program that uh, I have developed with my collaborator, Gonzalo Castaneda, who is uh, um, an outstanding economist in, in Mexico. I'm an economist myself originally, who eventually drifted towards the computational methods, or as you would say, the computational social sciences today. And, um, and because uh, my interest really have to do with, uh, with economic problems and also government policy making, um, I have developed uh, this, uh, this uh, tool called the PPI, Policy Priority Inference. So let me give you a little bit of context on, on uh, uh, the development of the tool. And the context would be basically the sustainable development goals. Some of you might be very familiar with this international development agenda. There are 17 goals. And there was another agenda before, the Millennium Development Goals, and there had been several before that. But something distinctive about the, the SDGs is not only that, as you can see, it is multidimensional, but it's also that there is an, an explicit acknowledgement about the complexity of this agenda of how do we reach the goals and the way they express it for example in the founding document of the agenda in 2015 is by explicitly mentioning the interlinkages that exist between these uh, many uh, policy issues they are interrelated so we can think about a network of interdependencies if i am able to improve uh, uh, certain issues i might produce spillovers to improve others or i might produce negative effects such as improving the, the uh, industrialization and then worsening the environment. So this is a challenge because coming up with policies to prioritize among these very issues can be difficult when there are interdependencies. And something important as well is that many governments in this uh, across the world, in fact, all the member nations of the, of the, of the United Nations have committed to this goal. So, they are going to try to, to reach the sustainable development goals. And it is also important to distinguish what, it is, what is a goal from what's an action. Normally, these two terms can be confused. So the way we think about goals is they are aspirations of, that governments or societies have. It is a state to, that they want to achieve, not necessarily the actions that they take to reach that state. And often, these goals are quantified and we use development indicators to quantify them. So in fact, there are around 260 something uh, or 230 something official indicators uh, collected by the UN to measure progress towards the SDGs. But obviously this changes from country to country. Some countries have their own indicators. Um, so there is variation there. And importantly, as I mentioned, governments uh, have committed to achieve these goals. And even if we're not talking just about SDGs, governments in general tend to set goals and try to achieve them, even if there are very specific topics that happen matter only in one or two countries. So let me give you an example of a very explicit way to, to quantify this. This is the document that uh, the Mexican government has to publish every six years when there is a new government taking office. So a, a full term is six years in Mexico. And by law, they have to publish a national development plan. They have to set out the different goals that they want to achieve. In, in the case of the government that took office in 2019, they uh, described these goals through three very broad axes. 
and they identify around 200 objectives that they want to, to hit. Those would be the goals. And in fact, from those 200 goals, they have formally quantified 60. So they have identified 60 indicators through which they will measure the, pro the progress towards the goals. Um, so Mexico is one example, but this practice exists among not only national governments, also subnational governments uh, across many different countries. And this is just an extract of that document. It doesn't matter if you don't read Spanish. The important thing is that you see, for example, this would be the description of one of these goals. It has to do with carbon emissions from fossil combustion. There is a description, and this would be the baseline value that they have registered during 2016. And this would be the goal that they want to reach in 2024. So this is a problem of basically closing the gap, uh, reducing emissions from 2.1 to 13. And you can see this across different dimensions, different topics. Um, so it is a, this is exactly the, the problem that the tool is designed to, to tackle. And in order to tackle it, we have to overcome uh, a few challenges. So first, there is a challenge regarding the data. So suppose that you as a government, you have a budget and you want to invest in, in uh, different issues that will push your indicators forward. So you distribute your budget in this way. Each bar would be a different policy issue. Um, now, from this expenditure, if you look at the data that exists in most, most countries about public spending, this data tends to be very aggregate, very broad. So it would combine data for the everyday operations, so um, spending to keep the status quo. And then from this, there is a fraction, they're hidden. That is what we call the transformative resources. These would be the investments that are designed to really transform the indicators and push them forward. So the first challenge is that you cannot distinguish the two of them. It is only in very few countries where they are starting to, to make this, this uh, disaggregate uh, data publicly available. So another challenge is that, okay, suppose you have data on the total budget and you have it quite disaggregated. So you can break it down into different fiscal categories or expenditure program. So some countries are working on this. In, on this, in fact, there is an organization called the Global Financial, the, the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency. And they basically help governments to develop standards to publish the data at this level of disaggregation. It can be very, very disaggregated. The challenge is that even if you have this detail in the data, when it comes to matching it to the SDGs or to the indicators that governments use to measure performance, then that is really difficult. They are most in most countries in the world, this data does not exist. So the fiscal categories might be very administrative oriented and have nothing to do with the, the goals that international agendas set. But this is a challenge. Um, part of my research is using, uh, for example, NLP to, to establish these links, um, but that's a, a different topic. Um, so PPI is going also to try to bridge this gap uh, with a lot of theory on how public expenditure connects with development indicators. And in doing that, we face a second challenge, which has to do th with the complexity of policy making. So suppose we have a government, and I'm going to represent it here with this little building at the top. And suppose this government has to um, spend across all these different SDGs. And the government decides first to allocate resources to improve the quality of education. So there go some resources, and then there is some improvement in the indicators. So there is an agent or there is an agency sitting, let it be the Ministry of Education, or it could be a specific uh, public servant. And this person or organization is going to take the resources that the central authority is giving them and transform them into, poli into public policy. And that is what moves the indicators. One problem is that in this process of transforming the allocation into public policy, there are inefficiencies. So an inefficiency could be the organization just doesn't have enough capacity, doesn't have the technology or the knowledge to implement the policies, or there is plain corruption and the money just goes away. All these are problematic because that means that the government is not going to be able to match what it is investing against the outputs. And of course, the government could then monitor, track the outputs, 
and try to infer how much inefficiency is taking place here. And then reallocate the resources accordingly if it thinks that there are other topics that could be more proficient. The problem comes when you have the network effects. So suppose you have improvements, for example, in the quality of health. So kids in rural areas now have older vaccinations. Uh, they eat better. And because of that, they are able to perform better in the school. Equally, suppose these rural communities have now better roads, so the kids don't have to walk for hours to reach the school. These two factors are, are externalities, are spillovers. They're going to improve the quality of education. And the government cannot see these spillovers. So they are going to have an effect in the outcome variable and in the indicator of quality of education. And this is going to opaque um, the whole supervision or monitoring mechanism of the government. And now imagine that the government has to decide among all these different issues and that you have all these interdependencies with non-trivial topologies. So this is a problem that we're facing regarding the complexity. And we can think of it uh, through this diagram. So as the, on the input side, you would have public spending, which goes through a process, a transformative process, where you have your agencies, the public policy agents taking those resources, implementing public policies. And what you see on the output then is the indicators and their movements. And to add some complexity, obviously we know that, as I just mentioned, we actually don't have data on public spending um, information linked to the indicators. So we don't know this. And on top of that, there are these feedback loops, these cycles, as I mentioned, the government might try to supervise how well a certain policy issue is improving. And maybe if, we, if the government observes that there are no significant improvements, it might take the resources away and put them somewhere else. So there is an adaptive component here as well. So this is why complex to address just with data analysis or just with, with pure machine learning, we want to actually model the data generating process. So we're going to implement a, a multi-agent system uh, with which uh, I guess most of you are, are familiar. Mm. Excuse me. So our approach will be a multi-agent system or agent-based model or individual-based model, depends on the discipline from where you come from. This goes by different names. And the idea is to have two types of agents. One is going to be a government agent, which is the one with the full resources and who has to allocate them across many different issues. And these issues are going to be interconnected. So there is a network of spillover effects. This is an exogenous parameter that I will uh, explain in a second. And there are other, a second type of agents who are the agents sitting on top of these different policy issues. They are the ones who receive the resources and transform them. And we're going to be also explicit about considering some important factors, important in the literature of uh, public governance, public administration and economics. Some of them have to do with behavioral aspects of how, how agents such as these policy making agents face uncertain environments. We are going to go not exactly in the approach of rational agents like traditional economics models assume, but instead we're gonna use learning models, directed learning, reinforcement learning. So they will establish their, the level of uh, inefficiency that they want to maintain uh, according to their experience. And there are aspects as well of public governance, which have to do with the supervision, the monitoring mechanisms that governments have in order to catch these inefficiencies and then relocate the resources and punish it if necessary. And finally, um, we're gonna use uh, indicators that exist from countries uh, like the ones in the UN or like the ones that Mexico uh, prepared for the national development uh, plan. And we're gonna calibrate the parameters of the model to generate certain uh, features of these indicators. So in general, the philosophy is that because we have very little data on public spending that is actually linked to the SDGs, uh, we cannot really use much uh, machine learning methods to, to uh, assess uh, how expenditure improves uh, these indicators. But we have a lot of knowledge from, as I said, economic theory, public policy, political science, public administration, about how humans behave and how governments act. So PPI tries to combine, to combine many of these perspectives, complexity economics, behavioral network science, uh, CSS and, and policy sciences. And you can think of PPI then as a, as a software package that would take these inputs initially 
I'm coloring them differently because the first two inputs would be the development indicators. What you want to provide is the initial conditions of the indicators and the final values. So you have historical data on your indicators, let's say for 10 years from 2010 until 2020. You give PPI the initial values and the final values, and PPI will try to simulate the indicators as they evolve and reach their final values. You also provide PPI with an interdependency network. So these spillovers contribute to the movement of the indicators, but this is an exogenous network, and this you have to assemble it separately. And there are many methods to do this. You could build it from the indicators themselves. You could use Bayesian methods to estimate the networks. And for example, some think tanks pro, um, promote the practice of gathering experts around the table and then filling an adjacency matrix with weights. And obviously, all this depends on how good is your data. So we're agnostic about the network that you prepare, how you prepare it, PPI takes it. And then that would be to generate indicators that match the, the historical data. So that's to calibrate the model, basically, to estimate the parameters. The interesting part comes when you want to do prospective analysis, so you want to simulate forward, for example, how long will it take the governments to reach the sustainable development goals? For that, then you provide the goals that the government wants to achieve. In the example that I gave you of Mexico, we're going to take the goals that are reported in the National Development Plan. And these are some of the outputs that you can get out of PPI. You can infer policy priorities um, when you don't have the data on how the government has exactly been allocating resources. You could say something about inefficiencies across these different issues. Policy coherence, which is a very popular topic in some international organizations like the OECD, um, which tells you basically if you're spending coherently with your goals or not. Uh, also, how feasible are your goals? Are we gonna reach the SDGs in 10 years really or, or not? Um, you can identify accelerators, which is this concept about key areas that could catalyze development through the spillovers. Mm. Also, you can measure resilience, for example, now with the pandemic. Suppose you're a government who has already figured out the budget that you want to allocate to the different uh, policy issues, but then the pandemic is not going to allow you anymore to continue with that allocation. Now you have to destine a lot of resources to public health. The question then is, what indicators will still arrive to their goals and which are not? So this is a resilience question. And finally, also public governance, how improving governance and monitoring can affect uh, reaching the goals. So let me give you a sketch of the model. Um, as I mentioned, there is an agent that is the government agent, which would be this circle, and the agent has this exo exogenous vector of goals. So this is, you, you give the government the goals, and then the government allocates resources to all these uh, agents who are the policy makers. And you can assume, let's say the first allocation is random, Okay, then each one of these agents should transform the resources towards public policy, but of course there is incentive to be inefficient, right? So you can be a corrupt agent and just divert uh, or, or embezzle resources, or you could also be uh, just lazy and just sit and do nothing and the money is going to be wasted. So agents face a trade-off between transforming these resources into the public policy going to the right or losing the resources. And when they transform the resources, then you have the indicators moving, and the movement of the indicators is, is conditioned through the spillover networks, right? So that's where you have the externalities, the spillover effects that produces movement in the indicators, uh, which eventually progress towards the goals. Now, the interesting part is that, as I mentioned, there are monitoring mechanisms so the agents eventually are going to learn how to balance this trade-off between being proficient, which gives them reputation, political reputation, because they are achieving their goals, or being inefficient in, and getting a personal gain from uh, diverting resources. And the government as well is going to supervise how well I am doing, how fast my indicators are moving, and, and is going to adjust according to how close my indicators are. So a common practice, for example, that was promoted in the Millennium Development Goal was to give priority to those topics where you have the largest gap between the indicator and the goal. That was a, a very popular heuristic, and we actually implement this heuristic in the behavioral model of the, of the government. So you can see that it's adaptive. So eventually, in every period, it adjusts the, the vector of priorities. 
This is a, a, just a, a very simple chart of, uh, of how the main components of the model work. So the agents, the policy making agents would take some of these resources and then contribute towards a public policy. So this would be the contribution of agent I in period T. And then there is a bunch of other factors that I'm um, encapsulating here. And what this produces is a probability of success. So the more I contribute towards the policy, the higher the probability that my indicator will grow the next period. So suppose you flip the coin and your indicator grows. Then you move to this stage, which is updating the value of the indicator. The next question is how much I'm going to grow. So that how much is going to be determined by a parameter. And this will be a free parameter that we will calibrate. And I'll explain to you in a second um, how we do it and, and uh, what it means, what is the interpretation of this parameter. But before that, I want to give you an idea of the, the dynamics of an indicator. So suppose you have an indicator that in the data had this initial value and then has this final value. So cover this gap from 3.3 to 1. PPI will simulate indicator starting here. And as you can see, it is a, a, an increasing, a monotonical increasing dynamic. It's always grow or doesn't, you grow or you don't grow, right? Periods of no, not growth. And then you might jump from period to period uh, until it converges to the goal. So it is designed to always converge to the goal because that allows us to have a more or less impartial way to stop the simulation. We want to stop when all the indicators converge. Now, the role of this alpha is to play with the size of the step. So you can think about it like uh, a modulator of the speed of convergence. And the interpretation is that alpha contains all those factors that we don't model explicitly in PPI. So there would be structural factors like technology or, or general infrastructure. And we're going to calibrate this one alpha per each indicator so that the indicators not only arrive to their goals, but they arrive in unison. So they arrive synchronized. Can I jump in and ask a question? Um, somebody on the live asked, in the graph, what do the edges mean? Um, Tian mm. Lang Bian asked what the edges mean. Excellent meant. question. Yeah. They are not causal relations. Uh, that should be clear. They cannot be causal relations because these are very aggregate indicators. So there is no way you could intervene such a high level indicator and then cause a movement in the other. What they are are really just conditional dependencies. So that's why we like to use Bayesian networks for this. So they will contribute here. They are part of here. So if other indicators that have, um, sorry, I think I am bouncing in the audio. Uh, I don't know if that's, uh, if you okay, thank you. So in this factor X, there are also the spillovers coming from other indicators and they will basically contribute to the probability of success. But in order for that to happen, the other indicators had to move through the policy that the respective agents uh, financed, right? So the causation actually is vertical. You have to go down to the level of the agents and then go up to the indicators and condition the movement. Um, so yeah, is that clear? Yep, yep. Perfect. So now let me show you an example of one of the projects that we have been doing uh, with, the, with the United Nations uh, Development Program. So this is the case of Mexico for which I showed you the, um, uh, the national development plan. So we took the indicators that they, they provided and, and we assembled a database uh, combining them with some of the official SDG indicators. And this would be the historical gaps that Mexico closed in the last 15 years. So the data would run for those 15 years and this is what history would tell us of what Mexico did across all these different topics. So using this data, we calibrated the model so that the indicators would replicate closing those gaps. And then we inferred the priorities. I'm sorry, I am still bouncing a lot uh, in, in the audio. The audio is bouncing back to me. Okay, uh, okay, excellent, now it's gone. So 
once once we find the parameters that replicate the the indicator dynamics um by the way we not only match the fact that they arrive at the same time but there's also another parameter that helps us match the volatility of the parameters so once we match those two features um then we can extract basically the the intertemporal average of our government agent on how the agent had been assigned in budget through time across all these indicators and you can see for that for the case of mexico historically for instance this topic sdg 16 which here we partition in in its two components in the peace and justice components and strong institutions well sdg 16 has not done very well in its component of peace and justice and if you are somehow familiar with with mexico you know it has quite some problems with violence and the, and the drug cartels and, and clearly, well, this is demonstrated both in the data and the model outcome is consistent because what this suggests is that the government has not been allocated a lot of resources to these topics relative to the other topics. Now, clarification here is that because this version of PPI does not take budgetary data as input, these bars cannot be interpreted as money per se. So the interpretation has to be qualitative. Right, so is one bar higher than the other? Uh, can we rank the bars? Can we rank the the different topics by which one what, which one was the most prioritized? In the newer versions of PPI, we now have sorted this out. You can now provide budgetary data and have a direct inference in terms of monetary units. But um, so now let me show you the um, that was the retrospective estimation, right? So that's the historical inferred priorities. But what about the prospective? So now that we have calibrated the model, what we want is to look at the, the priorities that the National Development Plan establishes, which we could translate in growth rates for each of the indicators. So these are the three broad axes of development, equality, corruption, and development. Each one has these indicators and the proposed goals. As you can see, they, they are quite ambitious. They, they want to reach a growth on average of 50%, an improvement of 50%. Those are their goals. And in some cases, it goes all the way up to 300%, um, things like that. So what we do is we take this information from this document and we map it into in our indicators. So we construct a vector of goals for the indicators that, that we have. And then we run, again, the simulation prospectively. And we extract, again, this, the artificial priorities that our government agent produces, which are these on the right-hand side. So now what you have here is a comparison between the retrospective ones, which are the ones I showed you before, and the prospective. This is telling us, given the goals of the new government that took office in 2019, how would it have to change the priorities that have been set in the past in order to reach the goals that it is proposing? The result that stands out immediately is poverty, SDG1. You can see that poverty is a highly prioritized topic for the government. It was not so much in the previous uh, governments. So this is the, the most outstanding one. Obviously, some other topics as well that have to do with SDG2 related to poverty as well, which is zero hunger. Um, they seem to be the, the most important topics. Something worrisome, we could say, is, for example, that SDG16 still remains under modest priority. It is not one of the priorities of the government. It didn't change much compared to the, to the previous ones. Um, so this is a, one example of the types of analysis that, that uh, one could do. Another would have to do with uh, feasibility. So something that I didn't mention is that you could have indicators in which the government cannot invest because there does not exist uh, an expenditure program or simply because the indicators is just too broad to aggregate to really say that the government can intervene directly. So those indicators in which the government can intervene, we call them instrumental. And those in which it cannot intervene, they are called collateral. And what I'm showing you here is, a, is the result of a simulation of the government, how long it would take for each indicator to reach its goal according to the, develop, the, to the National Development Plan. And we can separate it here, as you can see, between instrumental and collateral. On average, more than 10 years it would take. Remember that I mentioned a full term in Mexico is uh, six years. There is no reelection. Uh, that means that if they really want to achieve those goals, they have to think in a, in a dual term project. So it has to be a, a party government that stays for two years 
otherwise it will be uh, not realistic. And there are some other topics that are completely unrealistic, for example, this one from SDG 12. And the important thing about the, also to mention is that the collateral indicators, because governments cannot spend on them, they actually move because of the alpha, the, this structural parameter that we estimate. So all those things that we don't model here, and also from the spillover effects from other indicators. And a final exercise that we did was, okay, we don't have very disaggregate data between the public spending in Mexico and the SDGs, but they do provide some data set at the level of the 17 SDGs. So you can actually calculate, let's say that the left panel is the distribution of income across different fiscal categories. You can map this distribution into the SDGs, which is what we did on the right. So this we constructed, and then at the inside each SDG, then we have to assume some homogeneity in how the budget is distributed across indicators. But the exercise then is, okay, let's run again the simulation forward in time. But now, instead of letting the government adapt its, uh, its priorities and discover them, let's force the government to always use this vector that we're presenting here. And why this vector? Because this is the budget that was approved by the Congress in 2019 when the government took office. And the question is, is the if the government follows this exact distribution of resources, would it do better or worse in terms of time to reach the goals? Better or worse in relation with the time that I presented you in the previous slide? And these are the results. So if it would follow exactly the proposed budget, the one approved by the Congress, it would do worse. It would have a delay of almost two years in reach the goals on average. In some goals, it would do a lot worse that have to do with economics. In others, it would save time, actually. And the message here is that if you are deviating a lot from the priorities that, uh, if your budget is not consistent with the priorities that the government would discover, according to our model, we say that you are not very coherent with your goals. So you're not very coherent, for example, because these stars, which are uh, SDG, I think this, this has to do with energy as SG, SG7, uh, you are overspending probably here. So you are reaching too fast because you are putting too much resources and then clearly you're underspending here because these are taking just too long to reach. And I'm, I'm gonna close now by saying that, as I mentioned, uh, we have other versions of PPI in which now you can take budgetary data. So this is the pyramid of, of data inputs that you can provide to PPI. You can, you, you need this too, you need, some governance parameters to, to talk about the probability of monitoring and catching inefficiencies and the indicators, the initial and final values. And then we're working, what I showed you, uh, we're working with uh, comprehensive data series and networks. So we estimate the networks and those are the, the all the inputs that we take. But in the new versions of, of PPI, we can provide highly disaggregate data that uh, that is being published partly by couple of Latin American countries. And this data is linked to the SDGs. And you can even introduce some very specific contextual operative issues in, the, in how governments are able to move resources around. Because suppose you recommend a new vector of priorities to a government, but the government is going to tell you, you know what, that sounds great, but I can only move 5% of my budget. Almost everything has been committed because that's how the Congress agreed for it to be spent. So you can introduce all these sort of rigidities in the different topics. And this is the kind of stuff that only governments know. And, and that's why this tool is very relevant for governments because they can really uh, customize the tool according to their needs. And with this, I, I close. And uh, if you want to learn more, there is this website uh, where we publish the, the reports, the tools, there is the, the GitHub repository with the, the version that I showed of PPI. And, by the end of the year, we will release a second version that takes uh, some budgetary data. Um, so uh, thank you very much again, and I'm open uh, for questions. Great. Um, so thank you very much, Omar, for that presentation. Uh, it was really, really comprehensive and really, 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 really interesting foresight on where these areas of research can be expanded, which is what I liked a lot. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, before we go back into the presentation, you did have an, an additional three years of funding uh, with the United Nations for this project. Is that correct? 
Um, so the funding this time, the United Nations has been extremely supportive with us, but this new funding comes from the, um, United, from the UK uh, um, ESRC, which is um, what it stands for, the Economic and Social Research Council. And indeed, uh, we will be running this for a few more years, and we're trying to go in the direction of uh, using NLP to, to link public spending data with, uh, uh, with indicators. Uh, we have access to some privileged data sets that some of these countries have been building, and that will be, let's say, our training uh, data sets. And what we want to build is a comprehensive database of many countries in which we can uh, link this information. Right, right, right. That's incredibly interesting. And I wanted to go back to you talking about having run those multi-agent simulations um, and deciding which variables to actually link back to real-world problems um, in, in a computational social science sense, as you said before. So what I find really interesting is how you decide to eventually choose which variables link to a, an SDG, a sustainable development goal. And you know, when you're having conversations with fellow researchers on choosing those variables, what are the conversations that take place if it's, um, you know, looking back on your text, um, let's say inefficiencies versus feasibility or bottlenecks versus fiscal rigidity, how do you decide which variables are really going to change your simulation? Yeah, so the, the variables, uh, the construction of the model has been a process uh, fed first through our academic experience, uh, what are the, um, the mechanisms that are known to affect uh, development? That's the first. There are very well-known uh, topics, uh, uh, discussions in, in different areas of, of this of development economics. And the other is the fact that both uh, Gonzalo and I had some experience already in uh, consulting for international organizations and and seeing what are the practical problems that governments face. Um, so for example, the aspect about monitoring and governance, that is a central discussion. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Chen, I think the, again, my audio is bouncing uh, from some e echo. Okay, thank you. Um, so the whole discussion of governance and corruption and, and monitoring, that's a central discussion pushed by the IMF. Uh, so the previous director of the IMF had a very explicit agenda about talking about this and how it affects development because it explains why many countries, despite having very deep reforms, have not been able to reach the promised goals. So that's an ingredient that had to be there. Um, then the, the, the whole idea of the network, well, that is that comes from our complexity flavor. So both Gonzalo and I are very fond of this uh, social complexity literature, complexity economics. And this has been now adopted by some international organizations like the UN, the idea of interlinkages. So that, uh, that had, to do, had to be there from the very beginning. And besides those variables, um, we, don't, we didn't want to do this too detailed because the more detail you go and all of you know better than me, then you need more data to train this. You need to somehow introduce some free parameters, some new free parameters, and then when are you gonna get the data? So we, we try to reach that sweet spot, that balance between enough theory, enough mechanisms that are accepted in the literature and that are of interest to policymakers, and not too many so that we cannot calibrate it with existing data. So I hope that, that answers the question. Yeah, sure. So there are actually two more questions um, kind of lined up. This, the first one curtails off of what you mentioned about not having enough data. And um, synthetic data and simulations um, are, are topics of interest that aren't interchangeable, but interlinked. And obviously this is a multi-agent simulation for policy strategy. Um, do you foresee there being areas of research within this project where those feedback loops that give you, um, you know, more, more richer information on why you wouldn't choose fiscal rigidity versus another variable, um, can actually internally generate synthetic data. I'd be very curious um, on whether or not you foresaw, I guess, being able to sort of synthesize the data required for these simulations through, through, through the systems you've designed yourself. Um, well, by, if you're, by the synthetic data, if you mean, for example, all these 
uh, internal variables about budgetary spending or how much is being wasted uh, when an agent transforms the resources. So those we actually generate and, uh, and we have a couple of papers. We have actually a paper exactly on the issue of, of, um, of the wastage of resources. Um, so this is going to go back to the discussion of corruption. So if you look at the literature uh, on, on corruption and development, you have that most studies use cross-national data sets. So you have the US with certain level of corruption according to surveys and certain level of development. And then you have Canada and then you have the UK and then you have some Sub-Saharan African countries, Asian countries, and then you prepare this scatter plot. And you see this beautiful negative relationship in which the more developed you are, the least corrupt. Great, that makes sense. Yet when you go to the practical matter and there are documents from the World Bank reporting that reforms that have tried to curb corruption by reforming the rule of law, improving the rule of law or, or the judicial system have achieved nothing. You still don't observe uh, this, uh, this negative curve. And sorry, uh, the, the same negative relationship appears not only if you plot development, but you plot instead the strength of the rule of law. So the, the stronger your rule of law is, less corrupt of a country. Well, that has not happened even if the rule of law has been highly strengthened in many countries. And the reason is because the data that you're using to construct that curve is cross-sectional. It's not the story of the country evolving. No, you don't have the, the US going through different levels of corruption. These data sets are very new. So we use the model and the synthetic data that it uses, uh, that it produces on, on wastage of resources to capture corruption. And then we do experiments moving the quality of the rule of law in the, of the countries. And we find that this is consistent. This actually conciliates these two views because the reason why many developing countries have not improved is because if you just change the rule of law by itself, uh, it's not going to do much because you have other areas where agents can exploit and still extract personal gains. What you have to do is actually combine improvements in many areas at the same time uh, in order to reduce those spaces. So that's an example of how synthetic data uh, can be used from, from PPI. I hope that uh, clarifies the point. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Um, as I said before, this is a topic that I think only is now burgeoning due to only recent advancements in both computer vision for synthetic data and now you have these, these, these lesser known kind of applications for it. And I find it very interesting, um, which leads me to my next question someone had in the chat. Um, Basically, the reputation of, of politics um, and, and the role that political reputations play, especially with regards to simulations, because we can use simulations for something that's like the stock market, right? Um, and those variables are very known. It's just, you know, forecasting for time series, let's say. But when you're running simulations on, like, let's say PPI or government strategy, as I said before, with those variables, those have to be chosen, um, you know, very meticulously because you know, those are going to be how you end up spitting out a proper strategy for, for how things are going to work. And so what role do you think like, politics might play with regards to computational social sciences in the coming years? Um, and you know, what kind of researchers do you think will, will best contribute to a lot of these efforts? So I think that the, um, th there are, first of all, different flavors of computational social science. So if you kind of go back to, to see the very early origins, you probably could identify this school of Herbert Simon as the first one who actually started thinking about the problem of computing and how agents compute information and then the kind of problems that arise from that and the kind of limitations that you get from standard mathematical models and therefore the need of other techniques like simulation. And then there is another flavor that has been more recent uh, promoted, and that's probably the one that the media speaks about more, which is the one that comes just from big data, big data and networks and, and machine learning, which is fine as well. But still it's kind of a black box if, if you don't have the data generating mechanisms. So 
if if you it is fair to do contributions in both camps so if you do a lot of machine learning i think that's the best you can do for forecasting like ppi we wouldn't use it for you we would not use it for forecast but we can use it for causal inference of what happens if you have an experiment because you can actually design the, um, the experiment very cleanly of course as long as you're comfortable with the assumptions um, so they are two contributions that I think are complementary. Uh, for instance, I have other projects that look at labor dynamics. Um, and there, what we use is we start with machine learning to try to find the strongest predictors for labor mobility, why a worker would move from one industry to another. And then we, we, once we discover those features, then we, we go to the empirical literature and see if there is any indication of causal mechanisms existing and between these features and mobility and then we choose those that actually have evidence and then we model an agent-based model with those features and with very explicit mechanisms that go beyond what a regression could do so that's for example a way in which these two camps can be complemented so i think that the future of computational social science the kind of people that could contribute the best is are the ones that are open to both camps not just the ones that are in one or another uh, you need both the theory talk about causation uh, and also the, sof the sophistication of, of the methods that uh, can deal with big data sets. Great. Um, really interesting. And we have a question actually in the, in the live right now. Um, Jonathan Balak mentioned that a lot of the times problems with economics and simulations for economics um, have failed to transfer into the real world due to the predictability of set agents. So how, how does PPI combat the predictability of said agents? Um, what makes it different in a way? Uh, I, I'm not sure I, I heard the, the first part of the question correctly. Could you uh, say that again, please? Sure, sure, sure. So um, we have a question live where one of the reasons why past simulations um, in economics have failed to transfer to the real world was because of the predictability of those agents within the simulation. And the question is basically, how does PPI combat predictability of said agents? Um, so I'm not sure if I understand well the question in terms of predictability of the, of the agents. So if, if the question is agents are too complex and unpredictable, uh, then no model is going to help you there, right? So then there is nothing to be done. And that was pretty much the attitude that Frederick Hayek had who is this, uh, the Austrian economist, one of the fathers of uh, the neoliberal thinking. Um, so in that case, there's not much to be done. Then another that probably uh, uh, this question is gearing towards is the fact that agents probably expect the, the movement of the policy, the governments and anticipate the movement and therefore the model, a statistical model, for example, that that tries to, to capture the, the response of the agents to a policy uh, will not do a very good job because uh, the variables are somehow endogenous. So in that sense, um, the whole school of thinking of complexity economics tries to look at that uh, exactly from the point of view that agents don't necessarily have this hyper-rational attitude in, in which they foresee all the movements of the government, but rather they learn from their experience. That's what our agents do here. They just experience, and according to the rewards, you know very well, reinforcement learning. Just with that, they learn. And we have actually a paper in which we we address this uh, this type of question on um, on uh, how well uh, the a government could perform. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm thinking I'm, I am bouncing back again. Uh, it's a echo. No, thank you. So, uh, so yeah, we have a paper on this problem of uh, what is called the ex ante policy evaluation. So I, I make a prediction about the outcome of a policy before implementing the policy. How good would this be with an informed, with an informed policy from a model like ours, like PPI, or from a very technocratic, uh, very focused on, on certain uh, issues using very traditional models. And uh, what we find is that actually these kind of approaches in which you also simulate the actions of the government adapting with uncertainty and the agents, um, you can uh, produce a better, a better performance than, the, than traditional uh, models. And I'm happy to, uh, to give the reference for, 
for that paper. So I hope this more or less uh, addresses the question. Right, yeah, so he said, did answer that question. Thank you very much. Um, and just to kind of go into the last section um, for any questions you may have or anything else you wanted to add, I just wanted to segue really briefly into AI ethics, just because that's a huge topic right now. And I do think this research does relate to it. Um, how might you, you think that um, this research project um, in the years to come will further help to devise ethical strategy as well? Um, do you think that because of there being more quantitative data, um, people will be able to sort of ethically make better governing strategy? Um, do you think it helps with you know, machine ethics generally? Uh, what's your take on that? Oof, uh, I, it, for me, it's difficult to answer that question because we work with such aggregate data that we don't really come across into these problems of, of ethics uh, as someone who works with uh, social network data or something like that. Uh, the closest thing that I can think of has to do with transparency and accountability of governments. Um, so the way we, we think and we want to promote the tool to be adopted is that NGOs many times, they evaluate what governments are doing. So they evaluate if they are coherent in their public spending, uh, if, they, if their goals are realistic or is just political propaganda, and, and then they want to hold them accountable. So for that kind of discussions, I think BPI can, can be very helpful because it provides a, a very transparent uh, way to analyze uh, these issues. With the data that is available in the country, you don't need extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily big data sets. So that would be the closest that I could speak about ethics. I, to be honest, I, I just don't think uh, I, I have expertise beyond that. And, and I don't think PPI really uh, confronts those problems uh, so directly. OK, really interesting, really interesting. Um, so that will closely wrap up um, a lot of this discussion. If you want to add anything else, if there's anyone else in the live who has any other questions, um, feel free to add them. Um, as Omar mentioned before, references will be posted um, in, in the appropriate places for the link. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Um, I guess I also just wanted to ask one more question. Um, this is kind of just more with regards to um, developing countries, more specifically, because these are obviously SDG Sustainable Development Goals. Um, how might you predict um, that, let's say, infrastructure like Mexico or infrastructure um, in, in a lot of those other countries will be improved? Will it be that corruption is lessened more than anything? So the negatives will be more positives? Um, this is just more of a, yeah, more of a, an ab abstract question. Um, so, okay, so a couple of important clarifications here is um, that first, the kind of exercises that we do in with PPI and probably you saw, in, in the applications are short-term scenarios. So if you look at the tools that are available out there to provide uh, um, outlooks to governments and organizations, they tend to be long-term scenarios. So you have, for example, the systems dynamics tools, which provide very specific point estimates on how much carbon emissions will increase if the GDP increases in X percent. So we don't do that. I don't, PPI is not designed to do that. As I said, the priorities have to be interpreted qualitatively. Um, and therefore, because we work with short-term scenarios, I think I would be caution, cautious about giving any predictions in terms of longer-term issues like major infrastructure changes. The point, for example, of this factor alpha that captures everything else that, that we don't model explicitly is that some of that information in alpha is structural things like infrastructure or long-term aspects. That's why they are fixed in the prospective scenario. The assumption is that what happened 10 years ago in those dimensions remains the same. You only change public spending. Obviously, you can change the alphas if you want in your exercises, and, but that would require some additional interpretation from the side of the user. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that would be my take on this. All right, awesome, awesome. Uh, so this is just going to just about wrap up um, Omar's presentation on PPI. Um, 
Institute. You'll find more resources on the Alan Dory Institute, um, ACE as well, and where he puts up those references. I thought this was a really, really insightful conversation on using a little bit of a different strategy for you know, making policy and how it can also be a precursor for further machine learning research. Um, I'm sure that any practitioner, practitioners in the audience could fork um, the PPI repo and play around with using maybe other methodologies on top of that as well, which I actually have tried myself. <laughs> um, so aside from that, um, this is probably just going to just about wrap that up. There's no one else in the live. Um, thank you once again, Omar. Well, thanks a lot, uh, all of you, and uh, have a good uh, day.